This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Right, good afternoon everybody and welcome to what can only be described as a perfect way to start our afternoon and to start a new week. You can see we've got Ellie's that are busy chomping away at the dry vegetation as it, the sun shines, which is exactly how we would want to start an afternoon, as much as I want to start an afternoon, that is. Anyway, my name is Tristan. On camera, I've got Senzo this afternoon, and so it is a very, very, very nice to have you all aboard with us. Remember that we are coming to you from South Africa and Kenya, and that means that you can interact with us. You can do so on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, also at FC on the YouTube chat. Remember that your questions need to be relevant to what's on the screen, and then we'll try and get through as many as possible. But it's really a perfect way to start our afternoon. I was hoping that we'd get some Ellie's and you can see that the herd is quite big. It's kind of spread all the way through that thicket at the background, all the way along this side, all the way around and then we get kind of to the back end which are the bulls over here. So quite a lot that are around at the moment. Um, and this is a herd that's kind of been hanging about the last few days. There's a big, big, big female in here that I'll try and show you just now, and she's quite easily recognizable. It's not Fang, before some of you think that maybe Fang is here, but they have been seeing them dotted around, and they've walked all the way from the sort of eastern side of Juman up towards the sort of central west where we are now so they have been spending a bit of time in this area which has been very nice for us but it is an interesting kind of day for the first time in a very very long time we have got some summer clouds that have been building up today you can see if you look up a little bit that those big puffy clouds those are normally kind of synonymous with our summers we start to see those and they then eventually build into the big sun summer thunderstorms that brings up our rain so when you start to see these cumulonimbus clouds developing and it's always a good sign that summer is slowly but surely heading our direction and it makes for a beautiful backdrop to animals like Ellie's. Unfortunately the Ellie's are all walking in a, a very bad direction because they're going to go into the most heinous of thickets just now which is not going to be very pleasant at all but hopefully they'll slow down as they go. Yes hello to you too. You see she just stopped to say hello quickly as well. So Rosalind there's no way to really answer that and unfortunately there's no accurate number. Um, to say how many elephants make up a herd. A herd could even be something small like a like short trunk which is only four members um, and that still is a herd, it's her herd, it's her offspring um, whereas a herd like this could be 30, 40 and even get herds that are over a hundred so difficult to, to define it by a number but essentially a herd is a, is a female with you know her offspring and so that could be anywhere from three or four individuals all the way up like I say to over a hundred it just depends on where you are it depends on the numbers of elephants the conditions that are around at the time that will kind of work out as to how big a herd is or what defines a herd in that area now the go away birds have been alarm calling a little bit and I was hoping I could still see it and I'm trying to look around for it but there was a martial eagle that was soaring about beautiful big adult martial eagle and so I'm trying to see if I can still see it in the sky I'm sure that's why that go away bird is making a bit of noise they often are the ones that call when a eagle is about. Unfortunately, no. I cannot see it, so I don't know where it's gone. In, anyway, we're going to try and kind of reposition ourselves so that we're not staring straight into the sun with these ellies. And while we do that, let's send you across to James Hendry, who's also gazing at the fluffy clouds. We are gazing at a very fluffy, beautiful cloud, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome on the Sunset Safari here from the Great Rangers of the Western Kruger National Park. My name is James Henry and on camera today we have got Sebastian Rombi, the greatest French Gabonese Air Force pilot mm. in history. Our plan today is to try and find Hosanna, the young male leopard, see if he's around here. He was around here this morning, but I didn't see him when I came past here around about, ooh, what time was it? About one o'clock this afternoon, I didn't see him. But we'll have a look-see. It's a beautiful afternoon, early summer's afternoon, as Tristan was mentioning, and that cloud, of course, possibly one of the first great big thunderheads that have floated over this area in this, the beginning of the hot season. Very beautiful, is it not? It brings with it the promise of rain. And I think that there's going to be a lot of nice greenery popping into this area soon. We had a little bit of rain over the last few days. And now with the temperature sitting at a relatively comfortable 95 degrees Fahrenheit or 35 degrees Celsius, well, hopefully that will inspire some green growth out of the grass. Also a northeast wind blowing, which is a little bit unusual. 
and perhaps that'll rustle up a thunderhead, perhaps coming in off the Mozambican Channel. That'll be quite fun. Okay, I'm going to do a 180 degree turn now. And then we're going to go and see if we can find Hosanna. Thank you, Linda. Yes, come on, Rain. I agree with you. Let it come. Let it come. And of course, I'm sure all of you have been enjoying the coming of the summer, the emergences or arrivals of the migratory birds. Oh, there he is. Hello. Just coming to see you. Yes, good. Your appearance could not have been more spectacularly timed. You are a master of the screen. Yes. <laughs> that, everybody, is Hosanna, the male leopard, aged two years and now seven months. Is it say eight months? Two years and eight months. Hello, fellow. You heard my voice, didn't you? And you thought, ah, my old pal. Let me go and see him. I have no doubt that's not what he thought at all. I'm just going to wait here and see what he does. I suspect he's going to go towards the Galago Pan, where there's some water. Not much water anywhere else in the area. Very nice to see him. Remember, you can ask us any questions you'd like using the hashtag SpyLive on Twitter. Otherwise, of course, you can say, use the at FC on the YouTube chat. Blue 24, you say I mustn't move. Well, that's a very good idea. And as we remember that Horsana is, well, one of our very favorite leopards in the whole world, we must remember, of course, also that he is completely wild. And that although he's completely confiding with us in the vehicles, he is a wild animal. Good. Well, what a start it's been. Let's turn around. Clouds and leopards. Sounds like a song. Righty. Well, let us go up to the Marsi Mara now, where the Vov, been waiting to say that for a long time, where the Vov waits to say good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome up to a wet and chilly Mara Triangle, where it is a beautiful evening as the storm that has drenched us moments ago is slowly passing away. Good afternoon, my name is Steve. I'm joined on camera by jean -Dre. Can you believe it? First time and I think forever. Welcome, jean -Dre. Um And it is a beautiful afternoon. It is 28, apparently, degrees Celsius, 79 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm wearing my jacket, but anyway, we are out looking for lions. We spent most of the afternoon trying to find the Wino Pride where we left them this morning. Oh, yesterday. We also spent a bit of time trying to find the Sausage Tree Pride, and I think I've found them, but they're in an area we're not allowed to access off road at the moment, so we're just going to have to leave them be for the moment. But we left the Awinos there yesterday, and we've been searching all over for them and uh, seeing birds like that up on a tall tree, marabou storks and some vultures, sometimes can mean lion. And I do wish I was in Juma in moments like this. We could just take a little walk in there and go and have a look. Fortunately, we're not allowed to walk up here. And if we can't confirm a cat sighting there, we can't just drive off. Cat, you love the Mara. Well, the Mara is a beautiful place to be. And the storm is still around us. We were going to go back down that way to Salt Lake to see if we can pick up on some lions that side. And as we stopped here to do this little opening, we had a vehicle pass by who seems to think that the Awino Pride is on the other side of the road. He might have seen them a few hours ago. So we might have been looking in the wrong place altogether. So maybe we should turn around and see if he can find them. Give him about 10 minutes or so, Jean. What do you reckon? Yeah, let him go and let him go and do the work for us and we'll turn around and go and have a look in a moment. But in the meantime, Tristan is with a herd of elephant. I am still with our herd of Ellie's. As you know, I can spend all afternoon sitting amongst these gentle giants. I thoroughly enjoy spending time within the herds. I find that with 
any animal actually, the more time you spend with them, often the more little secrets you learn about them and the more kind of you can gain from being around those animals and so it seems sometimes silly just to rush off to the next thing and so I thoroughly enjoy just sitting around and watching them go about their day and it's a warm afternoon and so there's quite a lot of activity considering. I mean, there's lots and lots of digging and pulling up of roots and moving about. I would have thought that these guys would be trying to get themselves into some sort of shade and be sitting there or at least going towards water, but they probably have already done so. Given how dark their bodies are, you can see that they've got a bit of a darkness to them. So I think they've already been towards water and probably had a really nice sort of drink or swim, I would imagine, either at Galigo Pan or at Vuyatela Pan, the one in front of the camp where Hosanna spends most of his time. So, you know, I would think that that's where they've been already and then maybe that's why they're not on their way to water But I'm surprised that, that they are right out in the open kind of feeding as, as sort of slowly as they are because it must be fairly warm If we're warm sitting like we are they being much larger animals It's also been getting quite a lot of Sun and it's why you can see the ears are working quite hard this afternoon Lots of flapping of the ears as they try and just maintain their body temperature The nice thing for them today is that I don't know if you can see you probably can that there is a nice breeze that is blowing so there's a bit of a wind that is coming through so you'll notice some of the vegetation around them kind of moving in the breeze and I believe you can even hear it which is in the, even better um, and so that will at least be helping with cooling down and you'll find some Ellie's that are very clever will turn and they will actually put their back to the wind and so what happens then is that they just open their ear out and the wind does all the cooling they actually don't even have to flap their ears it's all done kind of for them which is quite interesting so hopefully we kind of see one of them doing it. it's always a laugh when they do it's kind of the epitome of laziness in an elephant is to be able to do that uh, laziness or smartness now this female's got very interesting ears you see when she flaps them forward that they're very pink on the inside which is quite unusual or is it sand that is stuck to them i can't see nicely it might be sand but there's definitely a sort of color change Kirsty, can you see nicely there? I've got lots of glare on my screen and also looking into the sun is not easy. Is it a pink colour or is it just sand that is kind of on them? I will have to wait for it to flap now that I've got my binoculars out. So apparently it does look super pink, which is very interesting. It is actually a pigmentation. Yeah, so she has got interesting ears. How's that? Now normally that kind of pinkish coloration on an elephant can sometimes hint at a, a little bit of leucism within them. So leucism is not to be confused with albinoism. Leucism is when they, you, they kind of cells lack pigments and so, well actually they have too much white pigment is what it is. And so it might be a bit of that in it. Interesting. Sorry, I'm trying to see with my binos because I'm quite intrigued by this Ellie's ear. Very, very cool kind of patterning on the back there. Nice, so I believe everybody is commenting. Also, if you look at this elephant, which is quite interesting too, if it turns its head a little bit more, I don't know if Senzo can get it, but you can just see that the hairs that are protecting that ear drum are very white as well. So normally what you would find on an Ellie, where those hairs are, are generally a very dark coloration, but hers are almost a caramel kind of white. It almost looks like they've been peroxided. No, you've opened your ear too much. I can't see it. At least I can see the pinkness now. It is most definitely her skin that is pink like that. How interesting. Mumka, you say a little bit like an Asian elephant? Yes, it does have that kind of same appearance, doesn't it? Asian elephants are very kind of known to have these pink pigments on their ears. Very, don't see it very often on, on African elephants. In fact, I haven't seen this for a very long time, but I'm intrigued because, like I say, the hair of this particular elephant on her ears, of course, she's now not going to face us, and I can't actually get around her because of the bushes next to her and, and kind of in front of me. So we can't get a better look on her side of her ears, but that hair is most definitely very white in coloration and far more white than other elephants. And so she must have a little bit of leucism kind of showing, which is highly intriguing. What astounds me about it is that her tail hairs are black. So her tail hairs are the normal kind of deep black color. So there's no kind of whiteness in the tail which sometimes does present itself in, in these leucistic pinkish elephants that you sometimes get. I actually remember seeing in Kruger a little baby um, leucistic elephant that was completely pink. It had very, 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 very pink body. In fact, 
it almost looked like a little piggy kind of running around all over the place. I felt sorry for it in many respects. It must have been very tricky with the sun to be that coloration. I would imagine that it wouldn't have been very comfortable. But I really want her to turn around so I can actually show you these ears because now she's not doing it. But you see both ears have pink. It's not just the one. <laughs> so Lily, who's three years old, you say it looks like the elephant is trying to fly away with its flapping ears. Now, Lily, you're probably a bit young, but there used to be a story for, for kids a, about an elephant called Dumbo. And Dumbo used to have big ears and Dumbo could fly. And so maybe your mom can tell you about Dumbo and show you Dumbo, but there was why they kind of, I'm sure, why that cartoon came about is because of the elephants always flapping their ears. But basically what she's doing, Lily, is actually trying to cool her body down, which is quite interesting. It's, it's working like a car. So in a car, Lily, you'll have a thing called a radiator. Now a radiator will have liquid in it, and when you're driving along, the wind is cooling that liquid, which helps to keep the car at a cool temperature and not overheat and so for an elephant it's the same thing it's got blood in its little veins in its ears and as it's flapping the air is kind of being pulled over it and actually cooling it down and that's allowing it to stay nice and cool in the hot African sun it's almost like having a fan that blows on you you know Lily if it gets very warm sometimes it's nice to have an air conditioning or a fan that keeps you a bit cooler and that's how the elephants do it because they don't have the ability to find fans and various other things out here they need to come up with their own ways of cooling down. Now what I'm going to try and do is there's a little gap kind of next to her here that I'm going to just try and see if we can sneak into quickly just to get a little look into the side of her head because I want to see her little ears. Now let's see if she, I don't want to push her though with her little one so we're not going to go too close. No, Kathy. so the skin of an elephant is not wrinkly because it's dry, it's actually wrinkly to increase surface area which helps with cooling as well as keeping the skin in good condition. It's just another Ellie, I thought there was something else coming from behind us. Come on Jigger. Now this ear is not showing it as much, but you can maybe just get a glimpse of it. It's almost like a whitish kind of hair that is sticking out of the ear itself. No, don't turn your bum now. Really? <sighs> she's being difficult. Now she's turned to kind of face the other way again. She doesn't want us to see her fluffy ears. Maybe she's embarrassed about the fact that she's got hair growing out her ears. Yeah, she doesn't like us looking at her. It's, I think it's also because I keep moving. She's just like decided she's, this is how, I want you to see my rear end. I don't want you to see my front side. There we go, she's turning a little bit now. Come on, turn some more. You can just see, you see how white that ear hair is? Very interesting. I'm surprised by this. Like I said, it's not, you can't see any other signs on actually on the body. Sometimes when when there's looses among these kind of animals, you generally see it on their tummies and their trunks, but I don't see anything on her other than her ears, which is quite strange. Anyway, intriguing and always interesting, and you see, that's why spending time with animals is always good. Now, somebody who is not camera shy is, well, not only Hosanna Cat, but also James Henry. I'm very shy of the camera, everybody. That is why I'm, I'm very retiring and speak quietly in a monotone whenever I know that I'm being recorded live. Hosanna is quite hot at the moment, his little pink tongue sticking out as he pants. And I'm going to be quiet now and just listen. You can actually hear his throat, sort of his larynx, I think it is, slapping up or moving up and down in his throat. naturally. Anyway, you could hear it going. That's what he sounded like. Now Sebastian thought he looked like he could do with something to eat. And I agreed until I saw him lie down here and I think mm. he's he's pretty well fed. Mm. I suppose he did sit on that nyala for some time the one that he dragged into the tree. No, I, don't, I don't think he's thin, no, Judy, he's in very good condition. I don't think he needs to fill out. I mean, he will fill out slightly more. He'll get taller as well. That's two years and eight months. 
two years and nine months now. Grief, can you believe our little chief is going to be three in February? Mm. An interesting uh, name here of someone called See You Kick. I'm not sure how you spell that, See You Kick. Uh, you're interested in how much smaller than Hosanna he is, at least than Tingana he is. He's quite a lot smaller still. I would put his mass in the region of 50 kilograms or so, uh, which is about 110 pounds. And I'd say his father was probably sitting about. Well, let's put him a little bit heavier than that, maybe 55 or so. And I think Hosanna's, at least Tingana's, probably around 70 to 75 kilos. Very few male leopards have been actually weighed and measured in this area. The average of the nine or so that they have weighed, or that I have record of them weighing, uh, was about 65 kilograms. Uh, you can just multiply this by 2.2 if you want to get to pounds. And uh, I think Tingana's, well, he's a good-sized male leopard, I'd put him at about 70 to 75 kilograms or so, and I think Hosan has got at least, who I, I would say about 20 kilograms to go to get to that size. This is all wild guessing, of course. But what was noticeable when I last saw a picture of two male leopards in the same shot, that was Hukumuri chasing Hosanna. Hukumuri is noticeably larger than Hosanna. And I don't think Hukumuri is quite as big as Tingana yet. Or I don't think he'll ever be that big, of course. And it was quite a shocking thing to see poor little Hosanna chased away by Hukumuri. And Hukumuri, in case you are wondering, is a six year old territorial male leopard. We're sitting pretty much on his eastern boundary. Tingana, who is Hosanna's father, again, for those of you who don't know, 13-year-old male leopard, uh, coming to the end of his tenure as the Duke of Duma. He came back from a mating sortie this morning, was shouting the odds, and quite interestingly, Hukumuri, we think it was Hukumuri, disappeared back into Arethusa, which is the reserve to the west of us. So I think Tingana still poses some threat to all the other males in the area, although he still tolerates young Hosanna in his territory. Now we have made a lot of mention of the fact that, you know, Hosanna's starting to mark, and when we say mark or spray, what he does is instead of squatting down and going to the loo, he now sprays his urine onto a bush, often fairly ineffectually, and a lot of questions have been asked about whether or not this is territorial behavior or whether Tingana will tolerate it. And uh, is this a sort of first time thing? We, we're talking about it as though it's unusual in leopard life. And while it's unusual for us because we haven't seen it necessarily before, it's not that unusual for a male leopard to stay in his father's territory for a long time. And I don't suppose it's impossible for a male leopard to take over territory from his father if his father died. Um, I don't think that if Tingana died now that Hosanna would be big enough or strong enough or mature enough to take this territory or hold it, uh, and, but he might in a year's time or so. So I don't think it's entirely out of the ordinary, the things that we're seeing here. And I also think that his behavior, his supposed marking, you know, he's obviously starting to feel the uh, testosterone starting to course through his body. He's going through puberty now, which means he'll act in a certain way without really knowing why he's doing it. You know, he doesn't squat anymore to pee. He sprays on a bush. All right, quickly, let's go across to Steve. He seems to have some lions that may well be on the hunt, which will be quite exciting. I'm not sure which pride it is, but there's a lot for them to eat. Welcome back. We have found the Oino pride. And one of the adults here, there is, we found the pride on the side of the road. They are on a kill of some sort. So I'm thinking it's a wildebeest. And this very young wildebeest is coming very close. 
It's possible he's lost his mum to this pride. And, well, I'm sorry to say it, folks, but the way things are going, these lions are probably going to take it down. We're going to stay right where we are. The wiener pride comprising two adults and three youngsters. Spent a lot of time with him last night. And she's really using the cover of the road. Using the cover of the road there to uh, to get some nice sort of sort of shelter. She's probably going to go in. The youngsters coming closer and closer. Stay with us, folks. This is 100% live. Anything could go on right now. You stay with the lioness there, Jean Drow. Keep you informed about distance if you like with that young wildebeest, and you can tell by her approach. The young wildebeest is completely unaware. She's clearly coming to look for her mum. I've seen this many times before. Youngsters, not necessarily wildebeest, but youngsters coming to look for mum. Going back to the last place they could smell her. Or the last place they remember seeing her. Look at that. Watch out, folks. Pay attention. She's moving with absolute speed now. She's not going to go low behind that bush. The wildebeest is about to come... Good afternoon and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Mara Triangle in Kenya. We have a lioness on the bottom left of the screen. She is busy stalking a very young, sort of five, six-month-old young wildebeest. We found this pride. It is the Awino pride. And we found them on the side of the road with what seems to be an adult wildebeest kill. And it's possible that this youngster is coming back to try to find out where her mum might be. The adult lioness that you can see. You can't really see anymore, but she's hidden from view. She's moved in very quickly, seeing the, seeing the individual is on its own. Watch out, folks. Look at that. She's moving in. P please feel free to throw any comments or questions below. I'm not going to take our eyes off the action for now. This is incredible. We've just arrived in the scene. I saw this young wildebeest coming in from the left, completely oblivious. It's probably too young to really think about the threats happening right now. And as the whole objective of the wildebeest being born the way they are is to be able to run as fast as the adults pretty much from birth. Within minutes, 10 minutes or so, they're able to move. Here we go. Watch it. Oh, my word. Look at that. That is extreme speed. Now, is another lioness in wait on the other side here? I'm not sure. Yes, on the road. On the road. Here she comes. Oh, she's too quick. She's running towards the other lions. Oh, they're in the right position. And does that answer your question about the speed? That wildebeest is absolutely motoring. That was incredible. My heart is in my mouth. Well done, young wildebeest. Phew. <laughs> Take a deep breath there. <laughs> and as I hope that answers your question about the speed of a wildebeest, it, I think that lioness was a little bit too cocky there. Could have maybe given it another moment. Surely your words were heard. The wildebeest heard you saying, go, baby, go. But unfortunately, the, the young male, that one there, who burst out of the scene right at the end, was really not well placed. <laughs> he didn't do too much, did he? The two adults, though, well, they're going to spend some time catching their breath. But it just goes to show, folks, I mean, right up there where that male is, somewhere in the grass, we haven't even seen it, but there's an adult wildebeest by the size of the horns I saw just briefly, which means that the five of them have fed on an entire wildebeest and she's still willing to hunt because that opportunity of a young wildebeest coming into sort of their scene was just way too much to give up well well done thank you for joining us all folks this was a remarkable little stint <laughs> well thanks for joining us with the awino pride here in the mara triangle uh, my name is steve and john drown camera and please feel free jump on board we are still live on youtube just google safari live and continue the action see you later good night
Wow, everybody. Wow, everybody. How was that? Well, let's move up a little bit and, and go and have another little look at the Aweno Pride. How awesome was that? Sure. Now, that is some speed from the wildebeest. Those lions were right on its tail. You probably, if you're watching, you might have heard the gasps and screams coming from the vehicle up ahead. <laughs> the wildebeest nearly got smashed right in front of their car. Well, well, well. Still, a, lioness has, a lioness has moved off there. This young male is back on the scene. He's trying to find out what mum's up to. Tiva, yes, wildebeest will definitely join another herd and it moved off with the herd. They're instinctively bound to move with herds and they pick up the smell and they're like, okay, cool, those are wildebeest, I'll hang out with them. But after a period of time, they were probably chased by their wieners earlier and a hunt happened and mum got taken. But in the, in the frenzy, the youngster got away with the herd and after a period of time of trying to regroup and trying to call mum and trying to smell mum eventually she gave up and uh, came and looking where is mum where is my mum gone and came looking as silly as it might sound as some emotional sort of heartstrings being pulled there nearly ended up in the same fate but um I'm just scanning in the distance, Jandra. This lioness is moving off again, but in the distance over there, I could see where the wildebeest left. That one adult has actually moved all the way out there to go and track it down. You can't see it, but it's to the right of the, the first big tree. But anyway, we're gonna see if we can get another view of all of these cats doing their thing. But in the meantime, Tristan has got Nyala quenching their thirst. We do indeed. So our Ellie's unfortunately went into a major thicket that was just not passable with the vehicle and so we've decided to carry on bumbling about and thought we'd just come past Gallagher Pan and we found a beautiful sighting of these Nyalas that were having a bit of a drink. They're finished now and are kind of just sniffing about. I don't think there is in really much in the way of food there, but maybe a bit of water that they're drinking that the Ellies have spilt. So the Ellies were here at some point during the day. Lots and lots of tracks for them all over the place. And so I'm sure they've pulled up a bit of water away from that kind of slippery concrete. And that means that these guys are much happier drinking in that shallow puddle as opposed to the kind of water that's in the actual sort of concreted part of this little pump pan because that will be quite slippery and if a predator came it would potentially mean they might slip and fall so much better for them to drink there you can see that they'll have a little drink and then they're going to start to wonder they're pretty much going to go back to camp i'm sure that's ned and his mates that are going out and they've been out for the day and will now start to head to the safety of the drc where they'll go and nibble on all the vegetation inside there and it's a common trait for our nyalas at the moment we have a couple of the bulls that have really decided that DRC is just as much their camp as anybody else's and kind of wander about there at night while we're having dinner and all kinds of other things and petrify poor Craig. So Craig the other day was came round the corner and came face to face with the Nyala and just about kind of uh, fainted from fright. It was very hilarious to watch because we were all sitting watching it and heard him coming so very very funny but he's um, unfortunately the Nyala was okay and both Craig and him went their separate ways luckily i think for craig i don't think you'd want to tangle with anyala given the size of those horns very pretty antelope though isn't it okay off you go then So Ladybird and Yalan and Elant, um, same family, uh, they both have spiraled horns, but an Elant is way, 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 way bigger than a Nyala. They are much larger and antelope also look very different. Hopefully maybe Steve this afternoon might even find an Elant somewhere in the Mara. Um, we don't get them here unfortunately, but up in the Mara you do get to see them every now and then. But they are just a much, kind of, they don't look the same at all. A Nyala um, has this brown kind of coloration as a male or a sort of rusty red as a female whereas an elant is a bit more kudu like it's a more gray coloration of blue gray particularly in the males and they have huge 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 shoulders and necks and bodies with sh much shorter legs than what you see from a nyala or a kudu um, and then the horn structure is slightly different the horn structure of an elant doesn't quite look like the nyalas the nyalas kind of bends in and up 
whereas an Elan seems to just kind of go straight a lot more with the sort of twirls in it. So it's a little bit different in that regard, but I mean, you can't really mistake the two just from a size point of view. The, a small sort of six month, uh, eight month old Elant would be the same size as those female Nyalas and, and maybe about a year old for the same size as that kind of bull Nyala they came with. And Elant is a huge, huge creature. In fact, the, the big bulls, when they're at their heaviest, weigh more than, than, a, um, than a buffalo bull weighs. So it gives you an idea of just how big an Elant can actually be. So they really are quite, quite special animals. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to go kind of along up to the north and then along the Bifelzook boundary for any signs of Tingana crossing back onto Juma. Um, if nothing there, then we're going to head off to the area where Brent had the tracks for the Inkahuma Pride this morning and see if maybe we can get some luck and see if we can find something. In the meantime, though, let's send you back across to James and the ever impressive Hosanna. There is Hosanna now. Don't worry, there is no problem, of course, with the camera. We are taking out the Fleer T1K once more. And there is Hosanna in glorious thermal image. And you can see that he's found the perfect place to lie. I say that because clearly you can see that the sand around him is much cooler than his body. So although it's been quite a hot day, He's found himself a nice cool spot to lie in. And in fact, his breathing has become slightly deeper and less frequent than it was a little earlier. So clearly he's settling in for a lengthy sleep. I think we're going to stay with him. I don't think we're going to leave him because we have to do... Well, we have a, a TV rehearsal a little bit later on today and we need to have him with us and also he's in a very thick block so if he does get up and move we'd probably lose him so let's have a, a nice chat about Hosanna and the coming months of his life there you can see him lying in the cooling dirt I had a wonderful experience when I was on leave in the Kruger National Park with my parents uh, we were apparently camping well we'd hired a camper van so it was kind of quite glamorous camping in theory Anyway, that's another story in itself, twice as funny as the one I'm going to tell you now. But I, uh, one morning we were sitting, cooking breakfast. I was waiting for some water to boil, because they give you water, boiling water at these little breakfast stops. And there were squirrels running around. It was very, very hot. It was much hotter than it is now. They were charging about the place. And every so often, every two or three minutes, they'd stop dead, all, of the, all three of them. It was three of them chasing each other, and lie down on the it was a sort of paved area and they'd just lie down flat they'd push their legs out in front of them and their back legs out the back and they'd lie down and push their bellies onto the cool ground uh, to cool down and then as soon as they'd cooled down sufficiently they'd start running around again and that's exactly what young Hassan was doing now he's cooling his body on the sand it actually really doesn't feel very hot this afternoon now without the sun on our faces. There's a cloud that's come over the sun and there's a nice breeze blowing. Brianna, there's only one big cat that can purr and that is the cheetah. The rest of them do not purr, I'm afraid. They growl, but they do not purr. The medium-sized cats, like caracals, they can definitely purr. I've heard caracals purr, but they have a very similar larynx structure to that of domestic cats. They're in the same genus, and they have a very similar structure to the larynx. Whereas, of course, young Horsana here has a big cat, or panthera larynx, which does not allow him to purr. I'm sure he would be purring if he could. Aussie Bonnie, those rosettes you see are crucial for camouflage. That is the only reason that a leopard has got rosettes. And while he doesn't look particularly camouflaged where he's lying now, most of their hunting is done crepuscularly 
or at night and that means that they move in dappled light and most of it is done from either thick woodland, even forest, uh, sometimes in deserts but usually they will use bushes as cover and what it means is that it's very difficult to see them in dappled light at dusk and at dawn. So they really are very nicely camouflaged at those times of the day. They basically, their fur takes on the appearance of ground that has got leaves fallen on it with bits of, or shafts of light shining onto the ground through the vegetation, if you know what I mean. That's what I mean by dappled light. That's why we think they have rosettes anyway. Maybe it's just so that they look pretty. Isn't it interesting how very clearly the spots are not all the same temperature? And his tail is very cold. So let's just look there. I'm trying to see which bits are hotter. I mean, the, it's the black bits, the actual spots. Well, the black and the copper inside the black bits are hotter than the white skin around it, which is what you'd expect. You'd expect those black bits to be radiating heat at a slightly hot or higher rate than you'd expect the white bits to be radiating heat. They'd also absorb it quicker, of course. Maybe there's some form of thermoregulatory uh, effect that those spots have, but I don't think so. I think it's entirely for camouflage. It really is amazing. Again, it strikes me every time I come back from leave, and well, most of the time when I actually get to sit with these cats, but to come back from leave where I haven't seen a leopard now, of course, for three and a bit weeks, to come back and sit within five or six meters of a magnificent wild male leopard is very special, even if he isn't doing cartwheels and trapeze. Alrighty, I'm not going to move from here. Uh, I may get bored in the next little while, but I don't think so. I think we'll stay here. Tristan has more large evidence. Indeed, we do. So another herd that is milling about, it's been an elephant kind of frenzy of late and so it's really nice to kind of spend time, like I say, with them. So another kind of grouping that came from Gallego Pan, it seems as though all of them went there for water during the course of today and then they've all spread out and it looked like when we went past the pan there that there was tracks for at least two or three different herds kind of coming in this direction as well as then the herd that we saw earlier not too far on the western side of the pan. So lots of activity there and it's because even though we did get a bit of rain this weekend and last weekend it still really hasn't been rain to speak of that has filled up any little pans or water points and so the really the only water at the moment on the whole of the Juma area is Gallego Pan and Weertela Pan so there's really nothing else I suppose a little bit at Buffalo's Hook but the water here is so much fresher that it's the worth the extra sort of half an hour walk for these ellies to go down and get into that area around that dam than it is or well, the pans than it is to go to Buffalo's Hook Dam itself So cats own as a bull is not rare at all in fact it's very common for bulls to go off on their own a female uh, quite uncommon. It's very seldom that you'll ever see a female elephant on by herself. Generally, if she splits off a herd, it's normally because she's splitting off with her family grouping, which is normally two or three of her own calves. So, you know, it's very, 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 very seldom that you would see a little elephant on its own as a female. I mean, if you find a baby elephant on its own, well, then you know that there's something majorly wrong and that in all likelihood her mother is no longer around and her mother has been killed by something or has died. But it's it's very, very, very uncommon to see, you know, baby elephants by themselves or even um, adult females kind of walking on their own. I certainly have 
never seen it. You sometimes see them kind of just a little bit off the grouping, but you'll find the group not too far away and they will join up. It's not something that happens quite regularly. I wonder if maybe in other areas, maybe where low density of elephant or maybe sections where, you, I don't know, you might find it in other parts of, of Africa, but I, I definitely have never seen it and never really read anything on females distributing um, without their family groups. I don't think it happens at all. You know, there's such a tight-knit bound sort of community amongst an elephant herd and they are so attached to the sort of bonds that I would find it very surprising that the females would want to distribute. I mean it's quite a traumatic thing for the young boys when they get pushed out. Unfortunately they really have to kind of you know think about being and they, they get a little bit depressed in many respects you can see them kind of moping about and they'll often try and latch on to any herds that come past in those first few years and they often get chased and, and then you know sometimes even latch on to the big bulls and that's where they'll kind of learn what goes on and so if you go up into the northern parts of Kruger where you tend to see a lot more bull elephants big guys particularly you'll find a lot of youngsters that join in with them and will try and kind of follow them around and they basically learn the ropes of being a big adult male so very seldom to see to see females but males it happens all the time um, you know they get left on their own quite regularly unfortunately for them fortunately for the the kind of genetics of elephants but unfortunately for them I'm surprised at how much grass these guys are actually eating I would have thought that by now, you know, the grass would be so devoid of nutrients, even the roots, that they should theoretically be eating other vegetation. Anyway, while we talk about elephants eating and watch them go about eating grass, let's send you back across to Steve up in the Mara, who has followed his lions and have taken him back towards the carcass of their own. Well, we are still with the Aweno Pride. How incredible. We are still trying to calm down a little bit. My heart rate went up a little bit in that previous sighting. So it doesn't always happen, folks. Even when the chips are down against the wildebeest, they all still have the opportunity to triumph. One versus five. How fantastic was that? But um, here we have got the two youngsters, the one male and one female, still busy eating. I can't tell how much meat is actually on that carcass at the moment. It's really hard to get a grip of it, but every now and again we can see them move it, and the head moves, and you, you get a set of horns. So it's an adult, whether it's a male or female, I'm only going to assume, due to the fact that that youngster came in perilous, perilously close, that it might have been the youngster trying to find mum. Very sad, very sad state of affairs, but um, it is nature, and they are feeding the lions, and, well, as many wildebeest as there are on the open plains, there's only so many prides of lion around, just like the crocodiles in the river, there's only so many that fall. We happened to get a very brief crossing earlier, crocodile smashed a wildebeest but unfortunately it happened so quickly we weren't able to broadcast and it's happening all the time and what you get to see is just what we get to show you so what is happening under the cover of darkness or along the length of the Mara River when no one is watching who can tell like that old adage if a tree falls in the wood does it make a sound if there's no one here there to hear it so much is happening out there in the wilderness all the time. But right now, the pale young male on the right. <laughs> Crazy legs. Well, the wildebeest, the young wildebeest came from behind us and it ran off in that direction. So it ran away from whatever safety or whatever herd it had come from. Um, that big tree there that we're framing um, we were in the last segment, Jandra couldn't frame there because of the position of our car, but the lioness, the one adult lioness, I think it was her, she was there, crouched down in the grass there. I couldn't see if she was hunting, but I think she possibly was having a look for that little youngster to see if she could track it down. And we haven't been able to see her or the youngster, and there is no wildebeest in too much of a close range that we can see. So, crazy legs, I can't answer that question for you, I'm afraid. It all happened so quickly we lost sight of it as it disappeared very quickly in the distance and Bob the killing success rate of lions is a lot of the time determined by the pride to the structure time of year the prey animal as well but on average it's about 20% 
which is quite low. Having a chat with jean earlier, he was at the pride once of two young females that I think hunted 15, 14 times in a row and missed. So sometimes you'll see lions hunt once and be successful. Sometimes you can see them hunt for hours and not be successful. It is a very low number, 20%. In this time of year, they probably have more of a success purely due to the numbers that are around. And hunting um, attempts are increased by the number of prey opportunities. Obviously, that hunt only happened because that lioness saw that youngster coming that was running towards the group. So if it hadn't have done so, there wouldn't have been a hunt. Very interesting. That is one of the youngsters. I've got flat top on the ears there. Jandre, you said you had a very funny name for this one, didn't you? <laughs> he's not going to tell me now. Well, she is flat. The young male is up. He's got a very full belly. Let's see if we can get a view of what he's eating. Well, we were pretty sure it was wildebeest earlier. Seems to be the growing currency, but have a look at his body. He's got lots of wounds on the back of his legs. Amanda, I don't think the young wildebeest was dependent. I think it's already grazing. Um, in the time I've been here, the last two weeks in the Mara, I haven't seen any of the youngsters suckling. Uh, they've all just been basically feeding on grass, just like the adults. So I think it's past that, that, that sort of dependent stage, and it will find comfort in the herd. It will find somewhere to hang out, even if it's a herd of wildebeest. I mean, looking in the far distance, there are thousands of wildebeest on the other side of the plain. But just within the immediate view of where we are, we could not see any. But if Jandre pans out, you see in the far distance there, on the other side of that plain, it's all wildebeest. So if it just heads off in that direction, it will be lost in the wave of wildebeest numbers. And, well, hopefully it will survive another day. I know it is sad folks we don't even know if it was mum it's just an assumption I'm making a little emotional sort of added to the to the scene but this young male has had his fill but would like some more I'm not sure how much of it was caught of him his attempt in that hunt but he said he hadn't positioned himself very well and the wildebeest with their longer legs and able to turn really really fast and um, they're quite fortunate in fact on a day like this after we've had some rain it's very muddy underfoot an area that's very muddy like this actually makes it quite difficult for, for hooved animals to move and they get a little bit more stuck and the splayed paws of a lion are a little bit easier to move with traction through a muddy terrain so invariably when it gets muddy like this there's a good chance that um, the lions would catch something and they were hoping they would there here we go. You could see a leg there. That was definitely not a zebra leg. Looks like a wildebeest leg. <laughs> the Paula is blended in perfectly indeed. And that is the back of him. If we didn't see the back of the ears, we would not see him at all, would we? In fact, uh, we were looking for the pride earlier, but um, we took different roads to get here. And well, they're just off the side of the road, so if we just stuck to the main road, we might have been lucky. But that is the way it works, Such It's all about gut and where we, where we should go. And we were headed in that direction towards where the rain is still falling. We were that sort of, let's go find some lions. And then, well, those people came this way, and there we go. I turned around just over here, not far away. So this is the way it works, Such It. This is the way it works. And um, we've still got one and two lions over here. That one is blended in perfectly on the side of the bank there enjoying the view that one is flat and then there's another one more left on the side of that little hill there there we go we are in the sighting with other vehicles folks you probably might hear the characteristic sound of an engine from time to time that is not Jandre clearing his throat it is a diesel engine starting up and there that is one of the adults I think that is on the lookout for some more pleasurable food as I said, it's a time of plenty for these animals. And they will just hunt purely because it's available. Even yesterday, we watched them moving for a long time, hunting. No real need to eat then. But um, it seems that the cats are coming out today. And Tristan Dix has found himself.
A cat. Indeed we have. So Tingana, for some reason, that today is being the most cooperative leopard ever. He's being like his son, in that we've both times gone looking for him, and both times he's just popped out right next to us. So Senzo spotted him across the boundary on Biffle's Hook, and he's just walking straight at us, and of course is now kind of scent marking in the most beautiful afternoon light. Isn't that magical? Very cool. So it's been a rather easy kind of afternoon with our leopards today, with Hosanna very... Well, good afternoon to you too, Tingana. That's very out of the blue at this time of the day. Okay, well, he's evidently got a lot to say. It's because the impalas have been shouting at him, I think, that he's just making sure. This is the area that he was mating within the last few days, and so maybe that's why he's just making a bit of a noise, just telling everybody he's still the dominant male here. Hopefully we're not going to lose signal. We are going into this little dip very close to Gauri Cutline, and sometimes we get a few issues. It's been okay in Jigger lately, so I'm hoping that if we just stay a little bit higher. But let's see, if we just stay up the, this end, and hopefully he walks, and then I'm going to let him go quite far until I'll eventually try to catch him on the other side of the hill, we should be okay. But he's just going to the toilets. Of course, when one soars, then it's just time to kind of, that extra bit of energy maybe is forcing him to now go to the toilet and get rid of whatever there was inside his tummy. I'm pretty sure that he's going to head towards Biffle's Hook Dam, I think that's where he's going to head. Marcy, I don't know, in the condition that he's in right now, for a while still, he's looking really good. He's big, he's strong, he's patrolling, he's calling, and no one seems to really want to challenge him too much. I mean, he's an intimidating figure, is Tingana. He is not a small boy by any stretch of the imagination, and certainly Hukumuri, even though he's got that fierceness to him and that kind of gaze, he definitely does not match Tingana in size stakes. So, you know, at, at this stage, for a while still, I would imagine, you know, a, a lot longer, but you, as you saw with the beginning of the year, things can happen to these cats out of nowhere and they can lose condition very quickly. And I think if that happens to Tingana once again, I highly, 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 highly doubt that he would be able to kind of hold on and there'd be too much pressure and you know the likes of Hosanna, Hukumuri, um, Umfakazi, this unknown male, all of them are going to be around these areas pushing and who knows what other young males are creeping around in these kind of sections that could arrive here at any day. So for now, I mean looking good, looking strong, probably easily could do another kind of year which would be nice and he needs to if he's going to have just mated with a female and father cubs he's going to need to do that for a while longer to keep those cubs safe but let's see I mean you never really can tell but he looks good enough to to still be the Duke for some time to come. Right, he's cutting off the road, so I'm going to try and kind of just keep up with him. We're going to go through here. I do apologize if we get a little break up, but stick with us. It won't be too bad. Also, going to need to block our noses because it's going to be ski as we go past where he defecated. As we get to the other side here, we should be very good. Bit of break up, but okay. Well, that's excellent news, Kirsty. All good. Look at that though, isn't that magnificent? There's very few animals that are like a leopard, I, in my opinion. Obviously I'm very biased, as we all know. I really love to spend time with leopards as much as possible, and so it always makes me happy to see them. But they really are magnificent animals. Their coat, and the fact that we get to just see an animal like this that's, you know, shy and reclusive for the most part in the world, just ambling down the road in the middle of the afternoon, really is quite something. So very, 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 very cool to spend time in the Sabi Sands. It's, it's one of the best reserves out there for this kind of viewing. Okay, well, he's going to take us, I think, in a little bit of a different route that I thought he was going to go. I thought he might walk the boundary quite far down towards Bufuzuk Dam, but it looks like he's turning and going to go south down into the Gauri Cutline drainage, which is not ideal at all because it's very, very thick and dense in there, and it's going to be a bit tricky to negotiate, but we'll try our very, very best, try and see what we can do. Deja Vu said he could use a meal. Well, I suppose he could. I mean, he's not awfully thin given that he's been mating. I mean, mating takes a lot out of these guys and they spend a lot of their time kind of exercising during that mating period and doing a lot of work. And that generally means that they are a little skinny on the sort of back end of the mating session. And he's actually surprisingly looking quite good considering the, the kind of things that he's been through. So, well, the mating period that he's been through. So, yes, he does need a meal, but 
he's not looking bad. Now, if the storm comes through and carries on building the way that it is, well, I think Tengana will be primed to be hunting. Storms are a good time for a leopard to hunt. They like hunting. It causes a bit of difficulties for a lot of the, the other animals um, to be able to hear and to be able to see what's going on. And so pretty sure that he will hunt this evening if that is the case now he's going to come straight down this pathway and i'm pretty sure he's going to cross over where i am down this path that you see here he's kind of moving in that generally southerly direction and this is the game path that he took exactly with that female leopard the other day so i'm pretty sure that's where he's going to walk look at those eyes what have you seen tingana So crazy legs, if he fathers the cubs, will the mom stay in Juma for protection? Maybe not. Um, you know, it depends on how far Tingana has been pushing to the north. What it might do is actually force Tingana to patrol slightly further north than he has been with, you know, the likes of Tundi and, and the rest. So it, it kind of depends on what goes on and kind of how things roll out. But essentially, I mean, she might. She might move a little bit to this kind of southern side if, if Tundi doesn't shape up and kind of come back into this area. It'll just try and kind of, well, have to wait and see, really, more than anything else. Good, so let's turn around because he's kind of gone behind us now. The flies this afternoon are ridiculous, so I'm just trying to swat them off as well. Now, it sounds like Brent, I mean, sorry, I don't know why I said Brent, but James, James are going to kill me for calling him Brent. But it sounds like James is still with Hosanna. So let's send you back across there and see what Hosanna's been up to in the last little bit. Uh, not very much. He's flipped over once, then back again, then he gave himself a little hug. Then he crossed his little paws over his chest and went... And now he's back in a recumbent slumber. Now, let us discuss for a second, because it's a very interesting subject, leopards going extraterritorially to go and mate with males that perhaps fall outside the territory that they would normally go to, if you know what I mean. Uh, we're talking about, of course, that skittish female. Now, there are two ways that this can happen, of course. One is that the female goes into another female's territory to mate with a male, which is what's happened here, uh, but her territory would still possibly fall within the ambit of that male's territory, if you know what I mean. So she was looking for a male, she sought out Tingana, and she mated with him, but Tingana's territory still encompasses her territory. Now, whether or not that is the case for that skittish female, we don't know. Far more interestingly, however, is the possibility, and this happens with mammals uh, of various species, is that she will fall pregnant to Tingana, go back to her home territory where there's another male in the area, and possibly mate with him, and then give birth to cubs that may or may not be of the territorial owner's paternity. Am I saying that correctly? Yes, I am. So, she could con the male in whose ambit she lives into believing that those cubs that she gave, gives birth to are his, when in actual fact they could be Tingana's. Now, that's not entirely unusual in the mammal kingdom. It happens, interestingly enough, amongst human beings, believe it or not, quite a lot. There was a survey done, uh, I think it was somewhere in the mid-80s, where they, it's a fascinating survey, this where they took DNA samples from various people that came into hospitals, uh, especially with their parents. Parents. And without publishing the names and without attaching names to any of it, they found that about 20 to 25 percent of people, of children living in Manhattan, in the New York City area, uh, were not in fact the children of the fathers, or were not the children of the people who thought they were their fathers. Does that make sense to you? In other words, they had been, or well, they were living in an environment where the mother had had an affair and uh, fallen pregnant, and the husband of the house thought that he was raising his own kids, but wasn't in fact. And of course, that gives rise to the word that we use with cuckoos, and that is cuckolding. And that's what happened there. So, you know, human beings are, are prone to it. There are a number of other species that are prone to it. Uh, certainly uh, in chimpanzees, it's quite interesting, or in bonobos especially, 
everyone mates with everyone else so that nobody knows whose parents are whose and that means that there's no infanticide at all it just reduces infanticide because anybody could be your offspring which is very interesting indeed so i'm not sure what was going on with that skittish female and with tingana but it is possible that she does not live in Tingana's ambit and that she snuck onto this property, mated with Tingana and will go home and con whoever the resident male is in her area into believing that her new cubs are in fact his. And Kari, you say that's very sneaky? Indeed it is very sneaky. And it's all largely got to do with reducing infanticide. Infanticide, of course, the killing of infants is common in many mammal species. And one of the ways that mammals have developed in order to reduce infanticide is to hide parentage from fathers specifically, because fathers are almost universally, or males are almost universally responsible for infanticide. Certainly in leopards, it's a major cause of leopard cub death. Well, exactly, Kelsix. Uh, they're not particularly sophisticated cuckolders, though. You say we wouldn't have the Jerry Springer show if we didn't have cuckolding. That is absolutely correct. They are, of course, the world's least successful cuckolders because they always seem to be at court, <laughs> and then they end up on the Jerry Springer show. So, yes, uh, at the very base level... I suppose we wouldn't have the Jerry Springer show if we didn't have cuckolding at its most basic and least sophisticated form. I feel like that sneaky leopardess is a lot more sophisticated than some of the creatures I have had the misfortune to observe on the Jerry Springer show. I remember we got Jerry Springer in South Africa, I don't know when it was, it must have been the early 2000s uh, when we got satellite TV and I remember flicking through the channels one day and seeing this Quite astonishing display of quite a human behaviour. I wasn't sure it was human behaviour. I haven't watched it since then, but I know what you're talking about. I'm certainly going to stick to that story anyway. I should pretend I'm not a closet fan of Jerry Springer. Does he still go? Yes, of course, and as Kirsten is reminding me, and The Bold and the Beautiful, which was a, a particular favourite of mine when I was about 17 years old. That's a long time ago. I think I last flicked it on when I came across it probably about five or six years ago. I don't know if it was still running then, but it was exactly the same thing. Quite astonishingly, none of the people on the show had aged at all. They had been so skillfully held together by plastic surgeons that they resembled, unlike me, the same people they were some 20 odd years in the past. Very skillful. I don't think we should talk about that anymore. Let's talk about leopards instead. All right, now we're going to go to Steve, who apparently is not a fan of the bold and the beautiful, but is in fact a fan of the days of our lives. Days of our lives. Now these are the days of the lion's lives. And James, I'm just picturing him sitting there on the couch watching Days of Our Lives, twiddling his thumbs. Such an image. <laughs> it was all over South Africa back in the day. I didn't really necessarily watch it per se, but when it was on, you'd end up sitting down because there was nothing else to do. Thankfully, though, I was a, quite a busy boy outside, so I spent a lot more time outside than inside. But every now and again, well, Mum was watching it. We would sit down and get absorbed in the niceties. Kirsty's saying I loved it. I can't say I ever loved it, but, I mean, I don't think those people's faces ever changed. In the 20 years it was on TV, they still had the exact same appearance. <laughs> I think South Africa is also watching about 15 years behind the States. So, it's very interesting. <laughs> it's very interesting. Well, here we go. He has a little bit of... Look at that wound on the back of his leg, though. Isn't that nasty? doesn't look very nice. It's in a really bad place as well. That skin's constantly moving. 
Maybe that's why he's such a lazy boy. But he's going to go give love to all the family members that uh, he's probably given a smack on the face while eating the wildebeest. But on his other side as well, on his right hand bottom, there's also a lot of wounds as well which is the characteristic sort of area that a lion would get attacked by a hyena or other lion. There's his sister or his mom, I'm not sure. Oh, hello. I want a little bit of love. I'm sorry for the bad behavior earlier. It was Rick. I promise you it was Rick. <laughs> oh. Anyway, on the other side, he's got some more wounds. So characteristic sort of wounds of maybe if he's been attempted to be caught by another male. Or if hyena have caught him on his own. Those are the kind of characteristic places where lions, hyena as well, get their injuries right there. Because they're normally running away or they're being submissive. And when a lion's submissive, if you've ever seen male lions attacking a male lion, it's really, really hard to watch because he sits down and they come around him and they're always trying to attack at the back, on the, on the bum and on the back of the legs. And um, those are kind of the marks that that is indicating to me. But he's still alive. He's still with us. So just wounds and scars a story you'll be able to show when he's a big dominant male oh remember this over here this was when that happened and this one over here yeah well that one was <laughs> yeah folks I, I suppose you know feeling sorry for lions you know out here in the wilderness they do get injuries and the the wounds that they can um they can receive can look really really bad but it's incredible how quick they can heal um, depending obviously that area is just a difficult area because of the movement of that leg every time he walks um, but we've seen I've seen terrible injuries on lions and they're just somehow they're very resilient they come back in as if nothing happened okay cool there's that lioness again exactly where I said she was before she hasn't caught the wildebeest she's still probably looking for it she's just to the right or the left of that first tree we spoke about she's sitting there having a little look I wonder if maybe the wildebeest has gone static in the grass somewhere there but you see she's got her interests are peaked and see the size of the chest even from out here very powerful chest all lions female and male probably see the, the wafting colors or movement across the screen that is evaporation had a, quite a big downpour we locked ourselves Ooh. There's a little something on the left, bottom left of the screen. What is that? Is that a jackal, I think? Uh, looks like a jackal to me. Jackal, maybe that's what got the lion's interests up. We heard a side-striped jackal earlier before we, before we turned around to come to the scene. And uh, they do like to follow lions around and scavenge off their carcasses. And it's not beneath a lion to eat a jackal. They are actually one of the preferred prey foods of leopards. Leopards love jackal. That's why we don't see too many of them in Juma, I suppose. He's very brave. That lion is off to the right still. The jackal is in the long grass. That lion seemed to have been piquing its interest towards it. Always competition out here. They always kill them and then just it's like, well, you want to steal from me? They kill them and then sometimes predators will eat other predators but I think initially Monique uh, we think we all like jackals and I'm in really enjoying how many we're seeing out here uh, it's just so many more open spaces for them and probably more dense sites less number of leopard and uh, lots of carcasses and small rodents and things for them to feed on so nice environment and hearing the side striped earlier I didn't know we got side striped up here but I've definitely get black backed I've seen a black back and now side striped I couldn't tell you what that one was very hard when the grass is this high and the back is there but they do look very very similar in fact the the, the black back and the side shop the side shop look like a very washed version of the black back but they got a very different core very good well is that lioness she's still there and these are all still here the feast is over it was definitely a wildebeest we saw that young male move it we saw him move it and there was hardly anything left I don't even think Tingana would scavenge off this kill.
Well, don't put it past him. We know that Tingana has a knack for finding others' skills and eating off them. And so I wouldn't put it past him at all to try and scavenge off anything. Doesn't matter how old or how many other predators are in the way. He seems to somehow find some luck when he arrives at these carcasses and is able to find food in even the most tricky spots. But anyway... He's busy, kind of just stopped for a few seconds. He was steadily mobile straight towards us and then just lay down there. I think he's come across a bit of buffalo dung that he's busy rolling around in and doing his thing. We know that the cats often do do this. He's slowly on his way towards Buffleshook Dam. He's going to take us on the difficult route, though. I thought he might just wander along the road all the way, but he's decided he'd rather go in the thicket, and it's going to become quite nasty in here for quite some time until he actually arrives kind of at the dam itself. And I'm hoping that when he does come to the dam, he'll drink for us and maybe even lie on the damn wall like his son does, has done once before. So Kim, if there's no other predators around, so nothing like lions or, you know, hyenas or wild dog or jackal, then probably not. Um, a leopard, ultimately, if it hoists a kill, you must remember that that makes it far more visible in its surroundings. Um, and so... Oh no, boy, he's back up and moving now. And it makes it much easier for you know anything to see it. So it would rather keep its kill down and stashed in a thicket than it would try and kind of have it out and exposed and in the open of a tree. And so the kind of reason that a lot of the leopards hoist their kills is just purely because of competition from other predators. If there's none of those around, well, you won't see those kills going up nearly as much. And if you look at some of the leopards, particularly ones that have spent a lot of time in areas where there's not maybe as many hyenas, you'll find that they don't hoist nearly as much as those that are around the big dens. You can see, look how he's smelling. Who are you sniffing, boy? A little bit of a Fleming grimace, just to check what's going on. I wonder if maybe he's not picking up the scent of that female, or potentially Hosanna. This is a route that Hosanna does walk sometimes, um, so you could be just checking. He doesn't seem to be too perturbed by it, so you can see he's not salivating in any way when he kind of sniffs. If it was another male and he was a kind of wary or upset about it you'd find you'd start to salivate there'd be a lot more calling going on so whatever the smell that is he's not really that fussed by it I'm, I hesitate to guess that it's maybe that female I mean she's obviously been with him a lot over the last few days and they've kind of been moving around and so it's very possible that she is kind of in this area so I'm just going to duck down so that you actually can see him as he stands and looks around uh, he seems very aware of his surroundings this afternoon, stopping and listening a lot. I wonder if that's maybe to do with not only the scent that he's on, but also that he's probably a little hungry and maybe wants some sort of food. But he's definitely heading towards Buffalzook Dam. And if he just strides it out and hopefully gets there in the next sort of 15, we'll get the most unbelievable light falling on him on that damn wall. So I'm hoping that's going to be the case. It should be a spectacular kind of sunset with him. Right, let's just try and kind of follow him as he goes. I'm going to just reverse back because there's not really a nice gap for me where I am. So I want to just try and go backwards quickly. Poor Jigger. Jigger's making all kinds of funny noises today and is not doing his thing. Now, I don't know if for some of you that may have been watching this morning, you might have heard a rather odd noise as we kind of finish one of our segments and then you wouldn't have seen me the rest of the drive. And that's because Jigger's alarm decided just to go blaring off. Now, the problem with that is that Jigger's battery does not sit in an easily accessible spot. Now, we're going to just have to check if this aerial can slide through here. So, unfortunately, what I had to do is I had to sit with a whole bunch of others with an alarm going off and couldn't actually get to the battery because well, Tingana was around and then it had to this alarm to go off and get out of the way but the car wouldn't start so it was just a bit of a mess but eventually we got it right we managed to turn off the immobilizer and get ourselves kind of sorted good now while we carry on with Hos uh, Tingana he's mobile steadily towards Buffalzook Dam now let's send you back across to James with the Hosanna who I think is doing the complete opposite and he's just lying down The opposite of what exactly? He's certainly not doing anything. He hasn't moved. He's stretched one leg out slightly, and that's all he's managed to achieve. Ah, Tingana on the move. Well, Hosanna was on the move a little earlier when he found us. Love to say we found him, but we didn't. He found us. It's turning into a gorgeous afternoon, and just real pleasure sitting here enjoying his company. The magpie shrikes are calling in the distance. 
we had the first European bee eaters that I've seen this season flying over, going choop 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 choop. So lots of heralds of the summer all around us. And even the odd whiff of sort of sweet smelling flowers, although I can't see any at the moment. Um, Jess, I don't really know, but normally leopards, or often leopards' noses don't change colour. It might get slightly darker, but sometimes they just remain pink, and sometimes they go a bit darker, and sometimes they're born dark and they stay dark. And so it's unlike lions, which almost universally go dark, especially in East Africa. They go dark by the age of about six years. They've got completely black noses, whereas here that isn't the case quite so much. I mean, they certainly do have dark noses, but it's not quite as clear-cut as it is in East Africa. So I don't think the nose which he's refusing to show us is going to go dark. Mosana, would you like to do something now? We're all waiting. Have been for some time now. Uh, Rachel, in theory, no, if you were to, I've never shaved a leopard myself, I think I probably won't ever have the opportunity to shave a leopard, which is probably not a bad thing, but in theory, no, the skin won't necessarily be spotted underneath, I'm just trying to think, um, you might be able to make out faint spots, but that's probably just because, you know, there'd be hair follicles still in the skin, but the actual skin itself is greyish, it's that greyish colour. Much like a dog's, basically. Much like most of the animals out here, they have a sort of grey-brown skin, like an elephant's. And that's why the universally asked question, an endlessly asked question of whether or not a zebra has got white stripes on black or black stripes on white. And yes, every time I hear that, I want to fling myself out of the vehicle uh, but I haven't done that just yet. Uh, the reason that it's an impossible question to answer is that it's neither. The zebra has got grey skin, much like a dog or a horse, and then it's got white fur growing out of some bits of that skin, and black fur growing out of some bits of that skin, and bits of brown fur growing out of bits of that skin as well. So they are grey with white and black stripes, as that leopard over there is grey with golden fur and black spots and copper rosette innards and uh, white as well on the belly and on the tail. Oh Nola, this is the great difficulty of spending this sort of time with a cat like this, is that he does look entirely huggable, doesn't he? The temptation to get out and walk over towards him and sort of snuggle next to him or put one's head on his uh, chest there and uh, read a book while the two of you enjoy the afternoon together is almost overwhelming at times. But uh, let me assure you, that cat would take a dim view of a human being approaching him at this distance. And in fact, because of where he's lying, if you were to walk up to him right now, you could get yourself into really big trouble because he'd feel quite cornered. Mm. And then he would be left with no option but to attack. And the speed and ferocity that that huggable cat would bring to an attack would be something unimaginable to a human being. So if it's all the same to you, I'm not going to get out and take a book over and lie down on his chest and read it. You can imagine using his back there as a pillow, you know? It like so, you, it like, looks so soft, does it? It looks so soft, yes, like you might a dog. Mm. Would be a very, very poor idea. Leopards do tame to a certain extent if you raise them from cubs but they never lose that wildness. And they are always, once they get past sort of 18 months, apparently, I've heard this from people who have experience of leopards in captivity, or people who've tried to reintroduce leopards to the wild, 
then they can, you know, they remain relatively dangerous animals, even to the people that they know. But there's something, you know, we, we thoughts just popped into my head, you know, we, we talk about them being wild all the time, and we talk about how we want them to stay wild, but what is it that draws us to them so much? If Why is it that we want to spend so much time around them, if not to develop some sort of connection with them? And if we admit that we are looking for some sort of connection with them, well, are we not admitting that we wish them to be maybe not less wild, but perhaps somewhat closer to us? I don't know. Let's go back across to Tristan, who has a hippo or tingana. Well, I have a hippo there, and you'll see that Tingana is about to walk right past it. So how often do you get to see that hippo out of water and Tingana behind the hippo? The hippo is not too concerned about Tingana at this stage, and thankfully not, because otherwise we would be in the firing line of Notia, and it would not be ideal if that hippo started charging back towards us. So I'm glad that that hippo has decided it's going to stay where it is and leave us alone. We'll keep following Tingana. You never know with hippos. Sometimes they've got a bad temper and they can just decide to chase everything in their path. And that wouldn't have been very acceptable behavior that, for us. And it seems like it's Scuba Steve and Snorkel Sarah. They're both just watching us through the thicket at the moment. We've got Tingana who's kind of slowly moving to Bufflezook Dam. And everybody is just kind of in between at the moment, which is okay. It's not going to be all right. The fact that that hippo didn't charge at Tingana when it saw it, it is kind of means that it's, everything will be fine for now. And he's going to come out onto this dam wall in the most beautiful, beautiful light, which will be quite spectacular. And I'm hoping that he's going to find himself a really nice spot to sit on the dam wall itself. Now, of course, he's going to stop right in front of us. I was going to try and see if I could sneak around Tingana because he was going to head towards the dam wall. Yes, go that way. Good boy. Well done. That is the perfect route that he has taken for us to sneak past him and to be able to get him in the most gorgeous light on the damn wall. Thank you, Tingana. You are an absolute champion for doing what you have done. You've opened the pathway for us to be able to do a very sneaky maneuver. Problem is, is if he goes down below here, it's not going to be very easy. But essentially, what we're going to do is we're going to turn so that I can reverse with him. So, Rosalind, which animal would eat a leopard? Well, another leopard would be one that would have to be a little bit careful. Um, if leopards sometimes do eat one another, uh, hyenas would eat a leopard. Um, lions potentially would eat a leopard. Um, I've never seen wild dogs actually eat a leopard, but I would imagine that they would if they killed it. Um, so, quite a number of things. Vultures, birds of prey, um, ants if there was a leopard carcass. I would imagine carcass beetles, if there was a leopard carcass, they would also go after it. So it just depends, really, um, on what happens to the leopard itself. Now, of course, Tingana is going to sit, isn't he? Is he sitting there, Senzo, or is he still standing? I can't see him either. He was supposed to be coming right out to where I am right now, but he could just be watching Bufflezook Dam for a little bit just to check around and see what's going on. There he comes. He's coming now, Sens. You'll see him coming into picture shortly. There he comes. So he's going to come straight down now. That might mean that he's actually going to go down below towards the water itself, which mm, will be okay I guess if we can get around. I just want to see which way he wants to actually go because if he does go a certain direction it's going to work really well for us and if he doesn't well then we're going to have to do a little race around the kind of edge of the dam to get onto the side that I want to get onto so let's just see. No he's going to go the opposite way to what I thought and so it's not exactly where I wanted him to go. I wanted him to go over the damn wall. That was the kind of idea. So we're going to just try and kind of reposition ourselves. I do apologize. We're going to go a long way around. Sorry, little saddlebilt stork. I'm going to ruin your afternoon. Apologies. Male saddlebilt stork is on our left hand side. That's, I'm pretty sure is not going to be that happy about me coming down towards the dam. and probably will fly away. 
wonder if a leopard would ever try and take a saddle build stalk. I suppose it's not beyond the realms of possibility. There's our saddle build stalk right there. It's a very pretty bird, that. Sorry, little saddle build stalk. We are in a bit of a rush to get round because I'm pretty sure Tingana is going to drink. And so what I want to do is I want to get into a very good spot that if he drinks, we can get him kind of head on. So we're doing the long way around, but I feel like this will be the successful way around, if that is even a thing. So let's try it. Depends obviously where he wants to drink. He might want to drink in a completely different spot to where I think, but I'm thinking that his general drinking kind of path is going to be, there we go, is going to drink right opposite us, which is going to be quite wonderful. So we're going to slide ourselves in here. Kel6, you want to know if Winston Churchbill is around? I don't even know who Winston Churchbill is. I gather it's a hornbill that Taylor maybe. So yes, there we go, the hornbill that Taylor is probably named. I was right. But we've got ourselves into at least a fairly decent spot where we can actually watch Tingan. In fact, Senzo, hold on two seconds. We're going to do this even better than what we've got right now because we can actually get... This is the furthest I've ever driven into Bilfuzuk Dam. We're kind of right in the water itself now, which is... There we go, look at that. Isn't that spectacular? Beautiful coloration on the actual water itself. It's about as good as it gets, if you ask me. How nice is that? Beautiful colors on the water as well. There's a bit of kind of almost golden sort of reflections coming off the water itself and then Tingana that's sort of looking just kind of past us at the moment. A beautiful, beautiful light and it's just we're lucky that we've got where we are, where we are because we kind of got this little island that goes into Bilfuls Hook Dam at the moment and that allows us to get sort of right in to the dam itself and so we've got a more kind of head-on sort of view of him than we would have had otherwise. And hopefully he's going to turn and face us again. Mrs. Lapwing, you want to know what's calling in the background? Well, it's your namesake is a lapwing that's calling in the background, a blacksmith lapwing that's making that ticking ticking sound. Um, there's also it was a three-banded plover that called just now too, so a few different birds that are calling, but the most, or well, the loudest one is by far that blacksmith lapwing that you're hearing. Isn't this beautiful? Can't ask for much more than that. Indeed, Kaya, and there are a lot of bugs on the water surface. It's um, that time of the year where we will start to see things like mosquitoes and various mayflies that will start to come out um, and hatch off the water surface. And so those all those little circles that you're seeing is most definitely little bugs that are coming off. Right, now while Tingana drinks, it sounds like Steve has got a very cool sighting of the lioness up in the Mara who are shouting about the fact that it is their territory. The Owino Pride is in full chorus. They have moved off from their wildebeest and they are moving into the wilderness back to where the other one lioness was and now closer inspection one of the young females is with her as well. So here comes the young female who is very sort of, what's the word, affectionately named as Papaya. She's got flat tops on the ears. There she goes. And the young male will be following her very soon. The adult by the name of Leechy, who's the pale white of the two adults, started a call, was answered by her sibling and by the others. The others didn't make too much of a noise, but it's always awesome to be in amongst lions when they're calling. And there was not much to be left of that wildebeest apart from some skin and a rumen content but everyone will be very happy to know that i was wrong earlier and it was not in fact the mom of that youngster it was a young adolescent wildebeest so i had seen horns 
I hadn't seen them too clearly, so if I had said it was an adult, I do apologize for playing with everyone's emotional strings. But it was still fascinating to see a youngster separate from the herd, coming in search of probably one of its, one of its classmates. Indeed. Let's keep up with the Awinos as they move across the drainage. This is an area where I spent some time with James in my first couple of days. We did a, a broadcast just here on this drainage as they tried to get cl as close as they possibly could to a herd of wildebeest. And, well, they weren't successful, but we know that they are very successful these days. But what we see, not always what happens. Nice little lugger here we need to get through. Cenac most certainly and on that note we're just going to be going to IR Kerr. Cenac, the lions and hyena, they, the territory is not designed against each other. Territories is a specific against the same species. So lions defend territory against other lions and hyena defend territory against other hyena. They are inter-specific which means they compete against each other for food resource which falls within the territory but they don't demarcate territory against each other. Of course when lion and hyena interact they will be calling and shouting and stuff which is quite similar to that experienced by, by lion versus lion but it's them saying this is my piece of land and uh, well they don't demarcate it against the opposite species but in hyena and lion it's quite sort of sort of specific in that regard they are the one sort of enemy out on the plains that we do notice throughout the world that they just have that eternal enemy sort of clash all the time with each other so the hyena will definitely compete with these guys but the territory itself is defended against lions lionesses in fact males defend females and if they see hyena well it's just predator versus predator they kill them if they can that is just a food resource. Oh, we've got a bit of love happening here on the right hand side. A little bit of love. Hello, girls. Okay, well, here are the Awino Pride all getting back together and getting up and mobile. And in the meantime, while the love continues, let's go back down to Tingana, who is quenching his thirst. Well, he's now finished quenching his thirst. He's now going to uh, probably just walk along the edge of the bank which is typical of a leopard when they are kind of finished drinking so I'm pretty sure he's going to find himself a little spot now just to rest but isn't that beautiful kind of him just on the edge of the water point is absolutely kind of a picture to be honest it's really very very pretty way to kind of spend the afternoon and I was hoping he was going to head here now the best thing that could happen is if he decides to go up onto one of these banks with this late afternoon sunshine oh no you're going to lie down there boy it would have been nice if he'd just gone onto the bank because there was a nice little bit of gold orange coloration on the bank itself which would have perfectly kind of matched his coat but he is posing as the duke that he is and regal as possible, I would imagine, on that bank. Have you got hiccups from drinking too fast, Tingana? Looks like it. Well, Matt, if you have a look, maybe if Senzo comes back, you might notice that I'm right in the middle of the dam. So where I'm parked is right in the middle. This is water here, and there's water on my le behind me as well. So there's warmer water over there. So uh, theoretically, this should be I should be underwater completely if this was in the wet season. So where we've kind of found ourselves is right <laughs> into the middle of this particular water point. It's the first time I've actually ever driven on this particular section, and it only has this island has only just formed recently. It's kind of dried like this and so you know we haven't really had this um, sort of island formation in quite some time the last time it was dry like this was in 2016 when it was completely dry and you could drive all over the place inside Bilfotuk Dam but look there he goes there's that golden light that I was talking about unfortunately he is going to cross past some vehicles now so we probably will lose sight of him for just a little bit and we'll have to reposition ourselves um, and try and kind of find a different spot. I'm hoping there's a little bank that he likes to sit on that I'm hoping he is going to go to. Right now my seat has even moved in the kind of chaos of trying to get into the sighting and get where I needed to go and so while I kind of reposition myself and get myself sorted out let's send you back across to Steve who's still following his lions as they carry on into the night. Here they go up and mobile the Owino pride led by the two adults 
they were doing some scent marking, urine scraping, urine spraying. They've called, they've shown their presence on the landscape. And bearing in mind, folks, the Wiener Pride is one of the smallest prides we have around at the moment, with only two adults. A breakaway from, I believe, the Sausage Tree Pride. And they need to secure a territory, an area for themselves. And they've got a very nice one here between the Olololos and the Sausage Trees and the Paradise that side. And there's so many, I'm trying to get my head around them. And Oh, hello. She's busy doing a little bit of urine spraying right over my shoulder here. You can actually hear the grass going. It's something very characteristic that lion and hyena do when they urinate like that, scraping the ground. Uh, there's a pedal gland in foot of most animals, and there's a gland in between the toes that actually they're giving off a scent as well. And it's very common in lion, leopard, as well as in hyena. So it's not just the urine being sprayed. It is also the kicking up of the dirt. And it has rained, so it is important to demarcate these again so that no rival pride will just move through. Hello, cats. You want to know how pride is formed? Well, let's try to keep up with them before we lose them in the light. But uh, how they are formed, basically, is um, one lioness. Could be a lioness from anywhere, really. Uh, it needs to obviously start off with a lioness. Um, and she could just head off into the wilderness and have some cubs by meeting a male. Males are well accepted. Uh, males that dominate an area generally have sort of quite sort of prey rich water accessible areas females will move into that area and then she'll establish a pride and it starts off simply by just her having some cubs and then once the if she has um, say three four cubs then normally 50 percent of them are male 50 percent are female um, it's a debate on how many of them will survive uh, but if she can get two one or two females to survive they will stay within the pride so these two youngsters in the pride will stay uh, the males after a period of time will move off and they'll have to go somewhere else but males will come and go uh, with regards to the mating um, but females prefer dominant males within an area so that they can look after the cubs because there's no point in having cubs if they're going to constantly be killed so that is the gist of it it is a little bit more technical than that but it starts off with one lion and her offspring and the females will stay in the pride throughout their life and there is some play going on up ahead yeah let's see if we can catch it maybe two of the youngsters just in the bush there Jandre just attacked each other I don't think we're gonna get it maybe come around this way this is so awesome to be able to follow lions like this there we go just off to the left here I'm going to do it again just behind the bush of course a little bit more up to the right as the two youngsters are having a play there they're walking through the landscape no doubt in search of some more food it's never enough food they're probably actually going to go get themselves something to drink it's probably a little little drainage system or puddle nearby that the adults know about and once their thirst is quenched well then who knows what to next we'll stay with them as long as we can but it's important after the rainfall that uh, animals especially when they have a territorial marking which is a urine or scent marking to demarcate it again so as to prevent others from crossing those barriers because with rain washing away the scent it can be sort of an unsuspecting intruder can come in but if an intruder comes in with the scent mark well then they're there for a reason so you only want to fight someone who actually wants to fight you know you don't want to fight someone who's because then you're going to fight everybody absolutely everybody who comes into an area so it's important to demarcate these things and probably throughout the area where there's been rain falling all the lines will be doing something quite similar and talking about territorial boundaries the poser himself is down in Juma in Ghana Well, Tingana is posing better than one could ever, ever, ever possibly ask for. He's up on this bank at Wiffelsook Dam with this blue sky behind him that is nothing short of absolutely spectacular. It's, it's a place that I've wanted to see him lie before. I know that Ali's once had a sighting of him up here when there was a whole bunch of buffalo at the dam, but it's this kind of golden light with this blue sky and these puffy clouds in the background that just make this absolutely 
beautiful. He's, uh, does he not look like a king up there? I think so. I mean, that's his most regal kind of position he could possibly have put himself in, if you ask me. He's kind of... only thing he's done wrong is that... So and Laura is, is a king of the hill, indeed. The only thing is, is he's lay the wrong way. So if he had left his tummy kind of face us and his sort of head were facing us, it would have been much better because he would have caught the last of that sunshine kind of facing towards us. But, you know, beggars can't be choosers sometimes. And so we still are having a kind of magical sort of sighting of him up on this particular piece of this sort of dam wall. So I suppose it's a termite mound actually, more than anything else, and really is a spectacular spot for a leopard to sit. It is, seems to be a place that he likes to lie. I've tracked him over this before, but have never actually physically seen him on it, which is surprising. I would have thought I would have seen him before. Now you can see his tongue is hanging out. This is the Hukumuri pose. I don't know why he's got his tongue hanging out. It's every now and then you'll find that um, Leopards do sit like this. Why they do, I'm not quite sure. There seems to be no kind of consensus as to what the actual reason for it is. But either way, it is spectacular that he is sitting up there. You can see even the clouds now are starting to get a bit of that golden sunshine as the last kind of rays are touching his coat. Look at that. Isn't that magnificent? I think that's spectacular. It's as good as you're going to get for a leopard posing up on a rock, well, anywhere actually in the Sabi Sands. Very seldom we get to see them as kind of high as that with the blue sky kind of in the background and fluffy clouds. It's not something that we get every single day. So I'm super chuffed with this sighting. We really have been spoiled this afternoon by seeing him kind of not only drinking but then going and posing up there but i think he's going to fall asleep eventually if that tongue's anything to go by he definitely is his tongue is kind of flapping down and his head looks like it's starting to get quite heavy and so i would imagine that fairly soon he's going to kind of rest his head and actually have a bit of a nap here but for now it's still posing as well as we could ask for and like i said there's a little bit of that kind of orange glow on his face at the moment which is quite nice and i wonder if he's going to start grooming himself oh you know we're going to catch some flies first are you tingy oh, there we go there's the grooming that i thought we might get very very special right now as tingana starts to slow down for the afternoon it seems as though Hosanna has decided that he's going to carry on where dad left off and decide to carry on moving Well, he certainly decided he was going to do some moving. He got up and he started stalking something. We didn't know what it was. And then we came out into this clearing. We saw some kudu miles away. And then Sebastian spotted a kudu slightly closer to him. He, unfortunately, in typical Hosanna style, became impatient and just marched out onto the road in search of, we think, a smaller kudu off to the right of your picture. Mm. And uh, well, the, the right of that picture there, not the black picture and the ones in the distance saw him immediately and started to bark at him and now he's lying down he's realized that he's been a little overzealous in his approach he's still looking around though he won't be desperate for food he has eaten fairly recently But leopards are, of course, the ultimate opportunists. Zephyr, you say that Tingana is the Duke of the Hill and uh, Hosanna is the Prince of the Road. Well, that could be true, I suppose. That would be one way of looking at it, certainly. There's the kudu with its very sharp eyes looking down this way. Seeing the terrifying spots of the young Prince Hosanna who's now staring at us yes look at you pant with your mouth shut you would not want those sharp canines anywhere near a piece of you they are very very sharp see how he's flattened his ears now as if that is in some way going to disguise him mm -hmm. from the kudu staring straight at him Osana, are you joking? He looks almost slightly ashamed.
the article he's quite I nearly said slight he's not slight but he's certainly got uh, there's no fat on him at all I mean his belly is is pretty lean I mean, he's in prime condition. You can see the immense muscles on his shoulders there. Minamu, I think they can get mange. I'm pretty sure leopards can get mange. Um, I hope that Horsana doesn't get mange. I think they have to probably be fairly compromised, like with lions. You'll probably find like with many of these animals, they carry various infections like we do. They carry various parasites and that sort of thing like we do. And, you know, whether or not those parasites or pathogens take hold in the body or on the skin very much depends on the condition of the animal in question or us, for example. So people who have compromised immune systems will fall prey to something like tuberculosis. While many of us carry tuberculosis, uh, unknowingly, we, it never affects us because, you know, we look after ourselves, we have enough to eat. And I think the same goes for the animals out here. So there's two Mungen males that were knocking about here a little while back that have succumbed to mange. Of course, the stress of their lives is immense. They're two nomadic male lions, nowhere close to taking a territory of their own, being harassed by everything. Uh, finding it very difficult to learn to hunt, no doubt. So the stress that they are experiencing will compromise their immune systems immensely. Whereas something like this leopard, it's very difficult to see Hosanna uh, feeling anything that remotely resembles stress. And of course, in the short term, stress will suppress the immune system quite profoundly through the secretion of adrenaline and glucocorticoids, which are two different kinds of stress hormones, or many different kinds of stress hormones, and they switch off any non-essential immediate crisis systems. So your immune system, if you're in immediate crisis, is not essential to your well-being. But over a lot prolonged period, obviously a sustained period that's a real problem it's not really a major issue if it's a quick stress because you know then those hormones subside but if you have chronic stress like those mangane males must be feeling well then the immune system remains suppressed you can hear the kudu barking at the leopard now so he's decided to go off the road I'm going to move because I don't want to lose him He's lifted his tail in surrender. All right, we're going to get into some fairly thick bush now, so let's go back to Tungana, who's not in any bush at all. No, he's not. He's on a beautiful, beautiful mound with these little pink clouds that are rolling past. He's decided he's going to have a really good nap up there, which is okay. For now, it's going to be pretty spectacular if he decides to kind of wake up just now and when it gets a little bit darker. What's wrong, Tingana? Is something biting you, boy? Face the other way, then they won't bite you. Yes, the other way. There's unfortunately there's no way to get around the other side with the way that he's facing now. So, and also the view of it changes completely. You get a lot of bush behind him, and I really like the kind of pink clouds with the blue and him sort of looking over, if he would just look over. But he's decided that he's opposed enough for one afternoon for now. He's going to decide just to lie down and have a little bit of a rest first before he does anything else for the evening. But like I say, it'll still be nice when that goes to a very black sky and he's kind of in the infrared, he'll really sort of pop out behind that well that backdrop will make him kind of pop out and I don't think he'll rest for that long I think you know in all our likelihood we're going to see him moving a bit there's his tail at least moving look at that typical little leopard tail that white tip that often gives them away Desi no I've never heard a leopard properly snore um oh what's put your head round 
come on. He doesn't want to. Um, so I've never really heard one snoring properly. Um, you know, they do every now and then, but you know, never. Well, make they make sounds when they're sleeping. I don't know if snoring is probably the the right word for it. Make heavy breathing sounds, but it's not quite a snore, if you ask me. Shame the flies are driving him absolutely crazy at the moment kind of all around his ears so never heard them really snore but they can potentially make a few noises during sleep and i wonder if maybe there, somebody has heard them snore properly i certainly haven't lions i have but never a leopard but how cool is that just that little bit of pink in the sky is what makes this that much better absolutely beautiful Tingif's chosen a perfect throne for the evening, that's for sure. Right, Tingana's going to sleep, but we're going to be patient. We're going to hope that he does wake up again. And while we keep our patience, let's send you back across to Steve and see what his lines are up to. Yes, well, that is what the Duke does. He's got a PhD in napping. There you can see the young male. You can just see the bit of hair on the neck. It's quite difficult to see at this age. He's still quite young, but you can easily see the wound on the inside of the leg that even at this time of night the flies are still festering around that is a nasty one but I'm sure he will be fine we've been following them for a little while they've had a little a few bouts of play and now there are also some of them oh wow there's some electrical lightning in the distance genre far away there's a very lazy lions. It's very hard being a lion in the Masai Mara, I think. Very hard. Ooh, what is the wind bringing to you there? What can you smell? Hmm. Hmm. Is there some animals in there? Oh, no. <laughs> that's, that's what the wind was bringing. It was a roll in the grass. Look at the size of his belly compared to the girl's. He's definitely had, excuse the use of the term, the lion's share. And if you were not sure he was male, quite easy to see underneath the tail. Okay, well, let's quickly go down to, to Juma with the little chief. We're still confused as to what on earth this clown thinks he's doing because three different groups of kudu are now shouting at him and he still seems to think that he has a chance to catch one of them. He's now staring at the first group because they stopped alarm calling at him. Now they're alarming at him again. Three groups going... <laughs> Osana, is it that you don't understand what that means, or what's the story? While we look at him and uh, wonder what on earth he is doing, just remember, of course, that we do have a number of rehearsals coming up for our sh TV shows on a Sunday evening. Those TV shows will run from 6.30 to 7.30 South African time, so Central African time, in the evening. And we've got rehearsals on Thursday. Well, we've got a rehearsal tonight from 6.30 to 7.30. That's going to be a private rehearsal. And then another two rehearsals on Thursday and Saturday, which will reduce the length of the afternoon safari by an hour. And then, of course, you'll be able to watch the TV show on the YouTube stream, as far as I'm aware. And you can interact with us as per normal. And then, of course, remember that the times have changed in the mornings. We are 5 o'clock, of course, until 8 o'clock Central African time, 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock East African time. Absolutely far beyond my uh, capability to work out what time that is uh, in the rest of the world. So we've moved into full summer time now. This cat thinks he's going to stalk from here, I cannot imagine, because not only have the kudu all seen him, every single antelope in the area will be looking towards where the kudu are shouting. Oh, that's beautiful. Isn't that a wonderful picture? Just beautiful. 
Very nice, Sebastian. Well, we answer driving up to leopards' question about whether or not leopards are more opportunistic than lions. I'm not sure they're more opportunistic. Lions will take every opportunity to eat that they can and to kill that they can. But I think that they are more... Well, they've got a, a wider diet choice. So they've got a much more Catholic diet. So they'll eat small things. They'll eat birds and fish and tortoises and terrapins and termites if they have to and things as big as kudu. Whereas lions don't have quite a wi as wide a selection of food in their diets. But all these cats are opportunists. They will all kill whatever they can and steal whatever they can too. Now oh, he's on the stalk again. Unless there's a scrub hair here that perhaps he can see. Which is a possibility. Now we're supposed to go off air in 30 seconds. Let's just extend for five minutes if that's okay. Just in case he does something. We have our rehearsal at 6.30 so let's just keep going a little bit longer. If he stops stalking then we'll roll the credits. Let's just wait for him here. He looks like he's about to pounce. And no. All right, quickly roll the credits before he does something else. All right, everybody. We will see you tomorrow, like I said, at 5 a.m. That is very early indeed. It means we're in the cars at 4.30 a.m. and out of bed at 4 a.m. Phew, I feel exhausted just thinking about it, but that is by far the best time of the day to be out. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for your questions and your comments. We will see you tomorrow at 5am. I'm going to sit with this clown for a little bit longer. See you tomorrow.